let's let you hold that for a second, then you can put it back down there. Okay. Well, we're both it. in there. Yeah, yep. how about that? Okay. Good morning. Today is 25 May, the year 2010. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer, Mickey Austin, and special guest, Bob Schofield. And today, we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Major Harry Vandeven. Major Vandeven was a B-24 pilot in Europe during World War II, so we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Harry, so good to have you here. Great. Okay, if you'll put this down, and I need to get you lined up here, and let's get Mickey. Mickey? Interview over. <laughs> TV over there, I get to see you. <laughs> oh, you can see over there, too. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Okay, okay, so we'll get you... Uh, Harry, would you uh, repeat and spell your full name for us, please? Full name, Harry William Vanderbilt, H-A-R-R-Y, W-I-L-L-I-A-M, capital V-A-N, D-E-R, space, and capital V-E-N. Oh, space there. It's a Dutch name, uh -huh. and the first part, Van Der, is no more than son of. Oh. My name is really Vin, that's why I got two capital letters in Vandervin. I see. Okay. In Holland, they don't even spell out the Vander. <laughs> Just capital V, period, small d, period, capital letter, and your name. Okay. That's why you can identify a Dutch name right away. Yeah, how good time. Uh, and your dad, what was his name? Willem. Willem, Willem. Vandervin. Okay. And uh, when and uh, when and where were you born? Chicago, Illinois, 1923. And the day, day and well, June 16. June 16. It makes you how many years young? 86. Wow, you look great. Doing good. Uh, and so your dad, uh, what kind of work did he do? He's a barber. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And how did he end up in Chicago? How did when did the uh, answer? Well, they came come? across the water and went through Ellis Island. My father came first, later my mother, uh -huh. and my dad got a job in Chicago with an Italian barber who taught him how to cut hair. Originally, he did cut hair in, in the Dutch Army. Oh, he did? Oh. Yes. Do you know about what year that was that he came over? I have over no here? idea. Okay. And did he know your mom over in... Uh... Oh, yes. She worked in a bakery, and uh, my dad was in the Army, and that's it's how they met. It's a for you. You can just sit it down there, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the um, oh, so they met over there in Holland. In Holland, yeah. And uh, and what was your mom's name and her maiden name? Her name was um, maiden name Jacob Antoinette. Antoinette Jacob. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, um, so, did they live in kind of a ethnic neighborhood in Chicago, or or? Or the regular the neighborhood. It was a Dutch regular? neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Everybody spoke Dutch. We went to Dutch Reformed Church, and everybody spoke Dutch. The school was Dutch. When I moved to California, I was still speaking Dutch. Mm -hmm. I was in second grade at school. Mm -hmm. Took one year to learn English, and so I was in second grade two years. Wow. Talking about Dutch, I'm like I mentioned from Southern Indiana in German Township. And I remember when I was little, I'd go around with my grandfather out in the country and say, uh, that old Dutchman lives, so-and-so lives over that old Dutchman. And I was like, gosh, this, this should be German. It shouldn't be Dutch people around here. We're talking about Deutsch, you know, but yeah, they call it Dutch. <laughs> um, and the two languages are entirely different. <laughs> yeah, no. They sound alike, but they're not. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and do you know why your, uh, your folks came, uh, left Holland? No. Okay. No. Probably maybe for a better life or something. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you remember? Do you remember much about Chicago when you grew up? When you were living there? Very okay. little. Very little. Okay. Um, and uh, do you have any brothers and sisters? One brother, one sister. No, I got two brothers, one sister. One brother died at birth. Oh. 
And the other two, what were their names? My brother was Anthony, my sister was Catherine, and they're both gone. Okay. And why did your family move to California? Health reasons. For who, who was? Uh, my mother. She had asthma. Yeah. yeah. And where in California did you come? Redlands. Okay. And um, do you remember the street you lived on where you grew up and stuff in Redlands? Yes, it was uh, Orange Street. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to Ohio Street and then Clay Street. Mm -hmm. Several places. Yeah. And uh, now you grew up during the Depression, I think. What was that like for you and your family? Well, when we first got to California, we lived on Orange Street. We'd wake up in the morning, there was no food in the house. Had any clue what we was going to eat. And open the front door, and there might be a quart of milk there, there might be a loaf of bread. Oh. Never knew who gave it to us. Oh. Uh, we never did stand in any lines like a lot of people did. Because when Dad came out from Chicago, he opened up Bill's Barbershop on Colton Avenue. He made Two dollars and seventy, no, three dollars seventy-five cents the first day at twenty-five cents a haircut, and he thought he's a rich man. But his instant success and in it stayed that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, what did your kids do for fun when you were growing up? What kind of games did you play, or did you go fishing? Did you? The only thing I remember is summertime we had to spend a lot of time in the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't remember. Oh, we go to the beach. Yeah. The Huntington Beach and swam. Uh -huh. And I built a surfboard. It was 13 and a half feet long. That's the way they built them in those days. You couldn't buy one. I found the plans in a popular magazine. So I built it in my high school project. And I used to go to the beach every weekend and use it. So I was one of the original surfers. <laughs> a body surfer or a oh, stand up surfboard? Surf wow. It was 13 and a half feet long. Oh, wow. I know uh, we were just down uh, down there in Huntington Beach a couple of weekends ago, and it's the surfing capital of the world. They that's say right. That's where surfing really started here. That's where States. I learned to surf. My gosh, yeah. They got pictures of the old surfers and the, yeah. the, guy, the legends that are still around there. I don't, I don't know if you've looked around that town or not, but uh, it's really neat. Yes, I have. And the fact is they had a surfing ch championship last summer. We were happened to be down there the last day of it, and it's a, it's a big deal. Um, so did you? Would you go there with your buddy? How did? How would you get to the beach from Redlands? Drive a car. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I bought my first car. What was that? Uh, 1932 Chevy, and I paid cash for it because I was the type of guy I never spent my money unless I had something major to buy. And I built a rack, put it on top of the car, and that's how I carried my surfboard. <laughs> um, so where did you go to high school? Redlands High. Right. Did you play any sports in no. high school? No. Okay. Did you have any favorite subjects in, in high school? I think popular mechanics was my favorite. Mm -hmm. But then the other ones I just got through. Were you interested in aviation? Uh, oh, then? absolutely. My hobby then was building model aircraft. So all my model aircraft were World One, World One aircraft, which I knew all the names at the time. I've lost them now, I don't remember, but yeah, yeah I've made a lot of them. And did you get to go up in a plane at all before you Yes, one time uh, we went to Tri-City Airport, which no longer sits there, and we, we got in the airplane and flew across Redlands and back. I think three of us in the cockpit <laughs> all stuck together. <laughs> and that was my first flight, and from that time on I was going to be a pilot. Do you re recall what kind of a plane that was? Oh, it's just a biplane. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, what year did you graduate from high school? 1942. Okay. Do you remember what you were doing December 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor, when that happened. Oh, I was just in high school. I was a senior in high school, but I don't remember uh, too much about it, yeah. what exactly was happening. Yeah. Were you up on current events? Could you see something like that coming, war no, on the horizon? No, I was not. Okay. And so what did you do after you graduated from high school then? Well, I got a job with the county, 
By the way, uh, how did you, you said you saved up money to buy your car. How did you make your money? How, what Paper you? routes, and then I worked at Wynn's Drug Store as a clerk and cleanup boy. Did you ever work for your dad in the barbershop? No, no. Um, so, okay, so you got, you got a job when you got out of high school doing what, did you say? No? Worked for the county flood control. And I was on the survey gang, and I did that until I enlisted in 1940, uh, December 42. And you enlisted in? Army Air Corps. Okay. And uh, uh, where did you take your basic training and stuff? Well, I enlisted at Marchfield. That's what it was called in those days. Basic training was uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And then from there went to Eglin Air Force Base, my first assignment. Eglin is where, isn't that where uh, Doolittle, the Doolittle Raiders, where they practice? Flew right over my tent every day. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, I was watching them. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> the B-25s. Did you have any idea what they were doing or why? I had no clue. It was just an airplane flying across. Yeah. But I was fascinated. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Well, see, I was right under the flight plan, right on takeoff, and I thought that was great because I was going to be a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how long were you at Eglin then? Oh, less than a year. Because while at Eglin, I applied for the aviation cadet program. Mm -hmm. Before the year was out, I accepted and then I started the program. And where did you where where did you start that? Uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Basic. Mm -hmm. Pre-flight. Oh, that was pre-flight. And then basic school was um, America's Georgia. Basic was uh, Columbus, Mississippi. No, Greenwood, Mississippi. Then van school was Columbus, Mississippi. And where did you get your wings? Columbus. Okay. Yeah. And what uh, what year was that? Month and year? Are you, what it was uh, class were you? March of nineteen forty four. And um, so, <coughs> you, of course, uh, some of the planes that well, first of all, did flying come easy to you? Oh yes, no problem. Yeah. Okay. And what were some of the trainers that you? On, on I started with a PT-17, then I went to basic school and it was a BT-13s or 15s, basic same airplane. Advanced school was a twin engine AT-10. Did you want to be a fighter pilot or a bomber pilot or did you care? Or? I had no preference. Mm -hmm. Just give me an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and so you went to multi-engines? Yes. Okay. So that put me into bombers. Yeah. And so where did you go uh, uh, from Columbus, then, or from Georgia? In Florida, I can't remember the base. Uh, I arrived there and I uh, found a flight line full of B-17s. So I, I flew those things and we were flying gunners. And later on I'll give a talk and we'll go into that. They were practicing the gunners? Yeah. We were flying, right? yeah. So they'd have a, a sleeve or something that another plane had behind them they would shoot at? Or you know, I don't remember the detail. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so how long were you there in Florida? About a month. Uh -huh. And then where did you go? Westover Air Force Base, B-24s, combat training. Mm -hmm. And where is Westover? Springfield, Massachusetts. And how to tell me the little difference between the? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, right now might be a good time. I'm going to focus in on this uh, B24 here. You can get you a drink of water too if you want to. Yeah. Okay, this may not be exactly like the one, ones that you flew, but tell us a little bit about that uh, and kind of point out some of the characteristics, like who was where and what kind of armament it had. And well, stuff. obviously, since I just got out of flight school as a co-pilot, mm -hmm. and we formed up crews at Westover, so obviously co-pilots on the other side of this airplane. Mm -hmm. I had a nose gunner, top turret, and there's no top turret on this one. Turret in the back, and the ball turret. They each had twin 50s. The waist gunners each had a 50 caliber gun. Uh, the bombardier also occupied the space with a navigator up here in front. 
And they, did they have the Norden bomb site? Yes. Also? Okay. But the Norden bomb site was not an all aircraft. In combat, they only had enough for the lead aircraft and the deputy lead. Mm -hmm. The rest of the plane, the bombardier, all they did is hit toggle switch. When when they saw the leads drop their bombs, yeah. they dropped theirs. So, uh -huh. yeah. um, and tell me a little bit of the difference between the 24 and the 17. Since well, you flew both of them. there's a lot of difference. In the first place, in those days, they were still learning how to build aircraft. They hadn't a clue. The B-17 was easy plane to fly. The B-24 was poorly designed, so I had calluses in my hands just from the yoke. My pilot was a little guy. Every landing, I'd had to pull the yoke back for him. He wasn't strong enough. Uh, the uh, B-24, you know, is a very narrow wing. It's called a Davis wing. The B-17 has a big wide wing we call a barn door. Um, this airplane is a better bomber than the B-17 because it, it carried twice the bomb load. It flew higher, flew faster, and flew further. And it had uh, hydraulics, whereas the B-17 had uh, electric. Electric, yeah, it was all hydraulic. Everything on there was hydraulic. Yeah, yeah. So if you had a preference for that since you flew both of them, which one would you prefer if you had to do it over again? The B-24. Did they, did they design, did it change any with the later models? Did it make it any easier uh, no. to fly? No. The flying characteristics were the same. <laughs> okay. All right. So now you're up in Massachusetts and uh, training on the B-24s. Did you get your crew there? Yes. First thing did crewed us up, yeah. and then we went and trained together. So what do you have? Nine, ten in a crew? How many? Ten. Oh, ten. Okay. And uh, did you, when you went overseas, did you keep your crew together? Yes. Okay. When we left Westover Air Force Base, they gave us a brand new B-24 right out of the factory. We told to go to Marrakech, for uh, Africa. We flew it over there, and then waited for a combat assignment. And, uh, and what was that assignment? It was the uh, 742nd Bomb Squadron, 455th Bomb Group, 15th Air Force, located on the uh, east side of Italy where the spur comes out. And what was the name of the... the, the San Gorgonio. Okay, San Gorg close to where... <laughs> close, the San Gorgonio Mountains, pretty close to where you grew up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me about your first mission. Well, that I recall, uh, since we were green, green, we had no clue what was going to happen. So uh, we took off, went into formation, and the gunners were all excited because they were going to shoot fighter planes down, and there were no fighter planes. Got over the target, there was no flak. There wasn't anything. It was a milk run. We dropped our bombs and came home, and I got thinking, man, this combat's easy. <laughs> But soon you found out differently, I would well, assume. Well, second, second mission was a different story. I'll cover that later. Oh, go, no, go ahead and do it now. Well, we went over there, we got to the IP and went from there. The IP is the initial point. It's a direct heading to the target. And what was the target that day? I don't remember. I've got it in my talk. Anyway, oh. uh, the sky suddenly filled up with smoke. I had no idea what that was. So we flew through it, and as uh, far as I know, everything was just fine until we landed. 125 plus holes in the aircraft. The I found out that smoke was full of flat, was uh, shrapnel in it. And then I was a little concerned about that stuff. Did anybody get hurt on your plane in any of your missions? No. The only time anybody got hurt, we, we crashed and the guy cut his finger. Well, how, how did you crash? How did that come about? Well, we just kind of, the pilot was taxiing out and he lost control of it and ran off the taxi strip because it had been raining and busted that airplane all the heck. Bent the wing all out of shape and after that they didn't let him fly as pilot anymore. <laughs> did you become pilot then? Uh, no, never did. Always I was always co-pilot. Co -pilot. And um, so you got you another pilot then? Yeah. Okay. And how did you, how was he, did you like him, your new pilot? 
Yeah, I got along with him just fine. And your crew, did everybody get along pretty well together? Yeah. Because you have to depend on each other pretty much, don't you? Yeah, we did. Do you have, have you kept in contact with any of them over the Used years? Used to, but I've lost it. I don't know where they're at anymore. And so how many missions did you fly all together? I had 35. Somebody, tell me some of your more, more memorable ones. Well, the most scary one, I was over at Munich. Uh, we had left the IP, they were shooting at us, dropped the bombs, one burst hit then underneath the aircraft, number two engine and number four engine were lost. The pilot, uh, this is my first pilot, he got all excited and ordered everybody to bail out. Well, being a co-pilot, I was going to be first, so I jumped out of the co-pilot seat, head for the bomb bay at a very fast rate, and when since there was no bombs, I was either going to dive or jump out of that airplane. I didn't know which. By the time I got underneath the top turret, the guy grabbed me by the back of the neck, on my jacket, yelling that the pilot changed his mind. Uh, okay, so I went back and got in the pilot seat, and then we flew home. Formation left us, and uh, now we're up in Germany all by ourselves. No, no bombers around us for support, and so I called a uh, in the blind for fighter support. After a few calls, I got a guy answered me, and I told him my problems. And I said I'd sure like to have some fighter support coming home. He, yes, so man, I'm pretty busy right now. And yeah, guess who that was? <laughs> Tuskegee guys. Yeah, with the red tail 51s. Yeah, no. And he never did help us. No. He said he was busy, and I guess he had his own formation to worry about. Yeah. So it was downhill all the way to back to Italy, over the Alps. But we you know we're at 25,000 feet, so it's, at that altitude, the airplane doesn't hold altitude with only two engines. So how low did you end up? Well, once we got down, you know, below 5,000 feet is no problem. It flew. Uh -huh. so we just made a two-engine landing. That was it. But getting over the Alps, I mean, how? Well, what, we were already at twenty-five thousand, so it's just, so just, just downhill all, down all the way. I see. Yeah. yeah. It was a controlled descent. And okay, you lost two. If you'd lost a third one, with the plane, I have no idea what would happen. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you didn't have to know. Uh, no, I didn't want to find out. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you? Uh, run into enemy fighters much? Never saw one. The, what the thing was, first part of the war, since I was a replacement crew, uh, fighters would come up 150 at a time. But in the 15th Air Force, our group, the kill ratio was something like this. Every time they got a bomber, we got about eight fighter planes. And the Germans didn't like bombers. If they got close to us, they got a face full of lead. Uh, you know, you're talking about bombing experiences. Another one that was rather unusual, we went to Greece to bomb some airfields, German airfields, with a bunch of fighter planes. When we got near the base, before we got to the IP, we formed a V formation with uh, 12, 24 airplanes. We had fragmentation bombs, which is nothing but a big hand grenade. <coughs> they come in bundles, about eight, eight to a bundle. Fractation bomb was about so long, about this round. They come in bombs, so when you drop them, as soon as they hit the sli slipstream, they would spread out. So when the lead ship start dropping his fractation bombs, our bombardier just start hitting the toggle switch. So we put a big pattern over the field, and destroyed the Air Force down there. Our P-51s dive down there through our bombs. And every airplane that took off, they shot them down before they even got the wheels in their wells. And then a burst of flight came up, knocked out number four engine. So I hit the feathering button, it wouldn't feather. Tell, tell us, uh, what, what does feathering mean? Oh, that means when you, you stop the engine, and then you turn the propeller into the wind so it cuts the wind instead of flat. Like it makes it like sideways. Sideways, yeah. And that way there's no drag, except that when we hit the feathering button, the fast feathering line was broken. That's why we lost the engine. And we pumped all the oil out of the engine. And then the engine froze. 
and then the propeller was not feathered. So in order to get back, I had both feet on the right rudder, and I, my back against the seat, and I held it that way all the way home, and made a three engine landing. But the engine was gone. When it froze, I thought the wing was going to come off the airplane. Um, and by the way, you guys uh, jump in here anytime you want if you have something you want to add or ask. Or, so, um, did you have a fighter escort most of, on most of your missions? A lot of fighters. Yeah, not all missions. Yeah. Just the ones that are most, li most likely to have fighter planes. Right. Fortunately. Uh, the other groups got the fighters and we didn't. It just turned out that way. For instance, you're, we have a place outfit across the way of the 454th Bomb Group. We had two runways called Cottontails because their tails were white. Ours was yellow. What happened, uh, one of the Cottontail pilots got shot up pretty bad, so he lowered his landing gear, a signal to their fighter planes that I surrender, and they would be an escort to an to a German airfield. On the final approach, the pilot told the gunner to shoot the escorts down. Big mistake. They did. Well, the Germans didn't forget that. So, every time the cottontails went up after that, the fighters first took care of the cottontails, wiped them out, and then they'd come after us. And maybe that's the reason I didn't see many fighter planes. Yeah. Um, My biggest mission, 1,500 B-24s. Munich. The Russian Air Force was there with their bombers. There were so many bombers over in Munich, we were getting in each other's way. We left the IP and had to make another 360 because the Russians were in front of us. Cut right 90 degrees in front of us. So it was a mess. I think we bombed Munich all day long. On any of your missions, did you ever see uh, your other aircraft in your area take a direct hit? From flak and explode. No, or uh, like that. in the cockpit you don't see much. The gunners get to see all the action. We're too busy flying. I'm flying formation. I can only look at one thing: the airplane. I'm flying a wing off of. So I didn't see anything. But there were probably times when you came back that other planes didn't in, in your group. You well, know, example, uh, we were flying up there in uh, Germany. I had a, I was in the slot number four position. I had a guy in my right wing. I was looking at him, and then we went through a little cloud, and then I looked at him again. He wasn't there anymore. He must have got a direct hit because I never saw the airplane again. He disappeared. So he must have got a direct hit. When you have to fly 35 missions, uh, how do you cope with that, knowing each time that you go, you may not come back? I just assumed I was going to get shot down any time, so it didn't bother me. It just, it was just combat. I wasn't scared. Concerned, maybe, but not scared. Because I just assumed it's, I'm going to get killed anyway, so why worry? And I flew that. Some of the pilots, uh, crews, didn't feel that way, and we had to take them off flight status because they were dangerous. So everybody acts different. I, was, I acted my way, and they acted their way. Your last two or three missions, uh, what, what part of the war was that? Was the war pretty well? Pretty oh, it was almost over then. Okay. Yeah. Because when I left Italy, uh, by the time I got home, that was the end of the war. Okay. And uh, were, were the was the flak still as bad? Uh, oh the last yeah, few missions? it was terrible. Yeah, but I mean, I the flak was the most dangerous thing up there. Not the fighter planes. It was the flak, because yeah. it shot down more airplanes. Or would, uh, like you guys, had to fall out of formation, and then if the fighters come, you don't have much chance. Oh, you're sitting duck. Um, but I would think that when you've got in 32, 33 missions, it's kind of a way on you. You know, it'd be terrible to get. Yeah, you know, you're you, particularly the last done. mission. Yeah. You've got to make this one because if you don't, it's terrible. <laughs> oh, it's, no, it's, we sweat the last one out. I would think, yeah. Do you remember your last mission? No. Um, and um, um, so. You know, that's been a long time ago. <laughs> kind of hard to remember those things. Now, um, were you married when you? At yes, this time? you were. Okay. Well, let's let's back up a little bit. Um, let's talk about in high school. Did you have uh, girlfriends in high school in particular? My girlfriend in high school is the one I married. <laughs> and what was her name? Dorothy. And the agreement was when I enlisted, 
When I get a commission, we get married, not before, because I knew I couldn't support a wife and buck private. And lo and behold, I got a commission, so we got married. Was there any thought about, you know, in the movie they talk about, well, should we get married, should not, because I might not come back, and this and that. And did that go through your mind no. at all? No. Just, that was the thing to do, right? Well, everybody was getting married, especially if they're going to combat. Let's go do it now, because we may not see each other again. And that's just the attitude. It was different. And so, what was her name, Dorothy? What was her last name? Forsyth. Okay, and uh, where did you, she was in high school. Uh, did she grow up in Redlands too? Yes. And what did her dad do? Orange grower. Mm -hmm. And how about their aunt, how did they all end up in California? Or do you know the answer? They were born in California. Yeah. The folks I can't tell you. Okay. And uh, so you got me, did, did, you, did you have any letters? Did you write back and forth uh, when you were overseas? Oh yes. Do you have any of those? No. So, uh, uh, I, I don't know if we mentioned, but uh, well, Bob's got uh, those pictures and things, but those kind of things too are nice to add to your story if you would, if you have it. Um, so, what did she do while you were overseas, Dorothy? Was she working or? No, I don't think so. I I don't know. I was overseas. Yeah. Well, I just, was she living with her? She folks? lived with her folks. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. And uh, so you came back. Uh, when did, uh, well, how did you get back uh, from overseas? Well, we went to Naples, and there was this liner out there. And I got the kid and the crew member, and I said, look, there's our ship. And it sure was. We didn't come back in our troop ship. We were in a liner, I think, across oh. about five days. Oh. It, we passed up convoys, and it was moving right along, but it kept zigzagging. And uh, just back and forth. And they had a pattern they flew in. Our, yeah. when they went on the ship. And so uh, I had my own private stateroom with about 15 other guys. <laughs> Enlisted men were all down in a hole someplace. Yeah. <laughs> the bunks were three three high. You couldn't all stand on the floor at the same time. Man, they packed those ships. <laughs> Where did you dock? Where did you? Newport News. And then did you get some leave time back in California? Yeah, I think we had about a week. And then where'd you go from there? Can't remember. And how, um, do you remember, remember VE Day, I, I assume? Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, were you get, were they training you to go over to the Pacific when the war ended? and? Uh, Overseas, over there? No. Uh, that's kind of hazy what happened that period of time. But the war wasn't lasting very much after that. Right. Yeah. And so did you get out right away? or? Did oh, no, I stayed in. Stay. Okay. I wanted to fly airplanes. That was my first love, and I was going to fly as long as I could. And was your wife okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So after the service, then where, did you, where were you stationed next? I mean, after uh, the war. Well, you know, I kept transferring around. Uh, I've been places like Hamilton Air Force Base, McClellan Air Force Base, Goose Bay, Labrador, uh, when, Germany, uh, when, Frankfurt. Okay, when um, the um, Berlin airlift, did you get involved in that? Oh, yes. I was one of the first planes over there. I flew the Berlin airlift. I went over as a co-pilot because I wasn't currently the airplane. What, what airplane was that? C-54. And uh, I wasn't long as a pilot, and then soon after that I became an IP, and what? I was training new pilots. Oh, instructor pilot. Yeah. And uh, I got 260 trips into Berlin. There's very few guys got more time, more trips than I have. And uh, So you'd be, what would, what would you be carrying? What kind of supplies? My first six months I flew the uh, out of Fosberg, Germany, British zone. All we carried was coal. And then the next six months I went to Rhine, Maine, and we carried all food, food stuff. Um, you have to be pretty proud of uh, 
what you did, I would think. Uh, yeah. In, in that. And that pretty much. Oh, by the way, when people. I became an instructor pilot in C 54, I was all of 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I think back, I said, how ridiculous can you get? <laughs> yeah. Were there any tricky parts of landing? To oh, get yes. Uh, a lot of the trips, uh, we went to Berlin and went on the gauges, instrument flying. Then we got to Tempelhof, made an instrument approach, a GCA. And there was a three story apartment building, one here, one here, and you flew right between them on the gauges. And that gets to you. So after doing that day after day, three times a day, I finally landed the airplane. I parked it, and I came apart. I was just shaking like this. And thinking about what I just did, see. So uh, usually you get out of the airplane, you go over to the snack bar and get a cup of coffee or something. So I just moved over to the co pilot seat. When the co pilot came back, he saw me sitting over there and he looked at me, he looked at the pilot, and said, Yeah, you're going to fly the airplane back. And me? I said, Absolutely. I can't do it. Look at me. So I said, I'll talk you through it. He brought it back. I did the landing when we got there. But man, that was one shook up co pilot. And then we're on the gauges. And we get St. Elmo's fire, which is no big deal. What is it? What is St. Elmo's fire? Well, that's when the airplane gets a lot of static electricity. And it was nighttime, so the tips of the blades of the prop, about six inches, looked like a neon light. The windshield had electric going back and forth. The only problem was we're on, we lost an engine, and my co pilot's flying it, and now he's all shook up. C-54, four engines? Out. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, it got so much electric it had to discharge, so it was a bolt of lightning. Chunk. You can hear a big boom. And I yell at the flight engineer to put spotlight on the instruments because we were blinded. And then it happened again, so I quickly changed seats with the uh, co-pilot. So I flew it, and I decided I'm going to land the first place I can find. And by the way, this is not the co-pilot that had to fly home. This is a different flight. Uh, I decided to land at Selly. It was the first airport I got to. On the flare out. The static electricity let it alone again. So I pulled the stick back a little bit, froze my stick, yelled the copilot, give me full power. He did. When my sight came back, I said, That's enough. So I went home and made a three engine landing, and everything was fine. My flight engineer was so shook up. When he got down, he took the wings off his uniform, went to the squadron ops office, gave him the wings as I quit. He never flew again, to my knowledge. <laughs> That was quite an experience. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> when you were flying into Berlin, um, was there any concern that the Russians aren't going to be too happy about what you're doing and might try and uh, stop no. you? No, no concern at all. Matter of fact, the people that load the airplane were Germans, and the ones that unloaded it in Berlin were all Germans. No, no, no. Uh, the Russians, I'm talking about. Oh, the Russians. Well, no, I didn't worry about it. I had some experience with the Russian fighters, but we won't go into that now. Oh, okay. Well, um, in in Korea, is that what you're talking about with the Russian Russian fighters? Your experiences with them? In Berlin airlift during the well. Well, let's go, let's go into it. Tell me about it. Well, on the inbound, there were three quarters: two outside quarters who went to Berlin, the inside quarter who went home. So there's an air-to-ground gunnery range. And the Yaks were, these were pillar airplanes, were uh, approaching their target, doing their thing on the gunnery range, and go up. So I'm flying along, and you know, I'm just a young kid. I got thinking, why not have some fun with these pilots? So when they all dove down to their target, I took a C 54 and dove with them. And of course, I didn't have any guns, but I flew over and I had Yaks all over the sky. They scattered all over the place. <laughs> And then, uh, wasn't long after I got back to my altitude, uh, the yak plane sitting in my right wing. I waved at him, and he waves back at me. <laughs> We're all grinning, see. He does his thing, and I do mine, and go on to Berlin. <laughs> my crew never mentioned this to anybody, because the newspapers got it. You can imagine what it would do. <laughs> but I was just having fun, you know. We're just pilots. Yeah. That's the way we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. 
so uh, so time goes on now. Then when Korea comes along, what where are you and what did uh, what did you during during that conflict? I was being assigned from Hamilton Air Force Base to uh, to Korea. I got as far as Japan. They changed the orders, and I wound up in the Philippines for three years. And I was in charge of all the warehouses at the depot. And then while I was there, I was TDY at Vietnam for about a year, working with the MAG. I was working with the French as an advisor. Mm -hmm. And I used to fly the ambassador around while I was down there. Oh. Now this is before Vietnam. Right, yeah, it's just when the, uh, Dien Bien Phu and those battles were going well, on. With the French, it was during the French Indo Chinese War, right. Indo not when Americans were involved. Right. Indo China, right. Yeah. And so the, um, you flew the American ambassador to. All over Vietnam. All over Vietnam. Yeah. Now that's three countries Vietnam. Which would be? Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Okay. So that was all French Indo China at that yeah. point in time. Yeah, it was called French Indo China. Um, did you fly into uh, Saigon or Hanoi or? or I lived in Saigon. You did. They in said a that big was, hotel. They said that was a beautiful city. Right on cities. the river. Yeah. One day, an aircraft carrier came up, our navy. Came up Saigon, and they turned that thing around in the river. And they were there for a few days, and then it went out. That river's big river because it could take an aircraft carrier. It came all the way from the ocean. Huh. I'm at my hotel. I can look out the window and see it. <laughs> now, was your wife in the Philippines? Yes. At that time, yeah. And did you have any children uh, by this time? Oh, yes. All my kids started school in a foreign country. How many kids' children did, did you have? Three. And what were their names? What are their names? Well, the first one is Sharon. Then I got a son, Dennis. And then a girl, Arlene. And where did they all live? Now? Dennis is in Illinois, Arlene's in Portland, and Sharon's in uh, Canyon Country. Mm -hmm. California. Uh, and what kind of work uh, did they do? Or, or their well, let's start with my son. Yeah. He's an Air Force pilot, retired, mm -hmm. same rank. He's a major. Mm -hmm. He is now a preacher man in the Catholic Church. Really? He's now working on his third master's degree. He's also a member of Menza. Are you familiar with Mensa? So I'm not the sure. top three percent of the United States in intelligence. You have to take an exam to get into it, but that's where he's at. School is nothing to him. He always aces the course. When the Air Force sent him to um, Texas A&M to study meteorology, he was the officer in charge of all the military students. He aces the course. He always aces the course. He's that way. Did he fly in Vietnam or? No, he flew the C-9s. And when he was in Germany flying, he was flying the, all the VIP around Europe, including the, the leaders of Germany. When the um, Iran had the hostages from the embassy, my son went in there and flew out one hostage named Queen, I think his name was, who got sick, and so they, my son went in there and brought him home. And he was also an IP. <laughs> <laughs> way, yeah. Now you said he's a deacon in the church. In the yeah, Catholic church? in the Catholic yeah. church. Uh, I, I, I meant to ask you when you were growing up as a kid, did uh, did your was your family very religious? Did you go to oh, church yes. and stuff? Yeah. Where did you go? Did in Redlands is a Dutch Reformed church, and after that we went to. Uh, Couple others. Um, and does your son have any children? Is he married? Does he have children? Yeah, six of them. <laughs> Five boys and a girl. Uh -huh. They kept trying to get a girl and they kept getting boys. <laughs> they kept trying. Yeah. And what's his wife's name? It was uh, Gigi, but uh, current wife is uh, Debbie. Okay. And. Uh, do you have any, uh, well, how many grandchildren do you have all together? Between uh, current wife, the one just passed, we have 38. 38 grandchildren? Oh, and those that married in were up to about 58. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'm and on my side, I got most of the grandkids are on my side. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to name them. Name I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't met them all. And your daughters, uh, uh, by your first wife, um, where do they live? And what what do? Well, you told me where they live, but what do they do? Or and how many children do they each have? Well, my first daughter has uh, two daughters. We have uh, two granddaughters and one great granddaughter. And uh, the one in Portland had four girls. Uh, one got married and just had a, a son. So I got a great grandson there. I got a lot of grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how many great grandchildren do you have? Do you I don't know. I think eight or nine. <laughs> and now they're starting to pop up much more frequently. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. So going back then, uh, your wife's in the Philippines, and you're over in uh, Vietnam or uh, Indochina. And so then, after those that three years, then what, where did you go and what did you do? Hamilton Air Force Base. Yeah. And that's where is No, that? I didn't go to Hamilton. Let's see, where did I go? Oh, Barksdale Air Force Base, SAC. Where is that? Um, Louisiana. Bossier City, Louisiana. Okay. And once you get in SAC, if you do your job, you can't get out. If you don't, you're out and out right now. Mm. And I was at Barksdale for five years. Was LeMay heading SAC at that Oh, time? he was. <laughs> did you ever meet him? No. no. Yeah, the May was the boss. So what was your duty there? Well, I started off in the squadron and wound up later in a group level and then in a wing level where I became a log logistics officer for the wing. And then I got inspected, I came out outstanding, and next week I was IG team, 2nd Air Force, and did that for a while. And then after that I became staff member at 2nd Air Force. Then from there, I was sent to Goose Bay, Labrador, where I became Chief of Logistics for a task force. I wrote the logistical annex for the war plan. The Cuban crisis came along, and it went just like I wrote it. <laughs> but I had briefed everybody. See, I had to go to back states, and all the people made up task force. I briefed them all. I had quite a job. Now, that was a big job, Chief of Logistics. <laughs> and what planes were they uh, flying in those days? Well, for where well, on task force of B forty sevens, B fifty twos, or someplace else, and I don't know where they were. Did you fly any of those? No. Uh, um, and the, uh, I mean, we know that. Uh, uh, oh no, the Cuban crisis you're talking about, yeah. Uh, so you knew all that was going on with that. Absolutely, I wrote the plan. <laughs> <laughs> the plan, which was the logistical thing. Yeah, I know, but oh, to I only the logistics. I don't mess with the airplane. That was operation did that. So tell me a little bit about the logistics of that. Uh, well, logistics mainly was when we activated the task force. I had to have housing, dining, transportation, uh, and just about anything that. By the task force need. to turn back the ships that the Russians were sending the missiles in, or, or what was what was the duty of the task force? Oh, we were going to bomb bomb Russia. Okay. Oh, okay. See, okay. that's By why task we were, all the task all the airplanes came in were C ninety sevens, and the general, if the president picked up the red phone, the, we would launch all the C ninety sevens. They'd meet the bombers coming across the water, refuel them. And each bomber crew had its own target. They always had the same target. They knew their target, and they'd go bombing. And once it got over there, then it's up to them to find a place to land it, because they're not coming home. And where were the bombers coming from? To make up a task force? Uh, all along the East Coast. I don't remember the bases. On station, over the North Pole, from Offutt and Loring. Oh yeah, they came from those places, uh -huh. Barksdale Air Force Base, mm -hmm. but I just don't remember, most of us 8th Air Force where they came from. 
And were they B-47s or B-50s? Yeah, okay. B-40s in the task force. In the task force yeah. uh, I was not involved with the B-52s. Right. Yeah. One of the fellows that I interviewed, he was a B-24 pilot in World War II and got shot down, flying out of Italy also. Uh, but then he stayed in like you, and he became a B-52 pilot, and he was stationed in Germany. And his target was uh, the, air, uh, the airport right by the Kremlin. So if the red light went on, that's where he was. He, he had a nuclear bomb. He had his own, own assigned target. Yeah. Yeah. All the bomber crews did. They didn't vary him. Every crew got his own target, and that's the one they, they concentrated on. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, that different in World War II. Yeah. Yeah. But then, remember, a bomber today is a lot more effective than a whole formation of B-24s. Now, remember the bomber, Norton bomb site? We could drop a bomb in a rain barrel. Well, you know what that rain barrel was? What percentage of the bombs fell in a 1,500-foot circle? That's reality. <laughs> But the population didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, well, that was pretty exciting. So, um, so you, so kids, you moved around quite a bit. And how was that? Did the kids adjust to that? Okay. Oh yes. Every kid started a foreign country, and, and if they were long enough, they start speaking their language. Yeah. <laughs> no, we had no problem with that. And. Um, what year did you retire from the service? 1963. Okay. And uh, uh, so that wasn't too long after the uh, where you're doing the logistics. Uh, was that? Did you do that up until? That you was my there? last assignment. Your last assignment. Yeah. And from Goose Bay, Labrador, I went to the states at the port, and that's where I retired. Okay. And uh, what did you do after you retired? took the GI Bill and picked up a couple more years of college. Then I became an accountant. I worked for the Harris Company as their number two accountant. I was studying the old man's job. I was going to be the, the, the accountant. And I decided if I want to keep the job, so I checked the payroll record and see what the old man was making, and it was ridiculous. So I put feelers out, and then I got a job with a steel company, raised my income 50 percent, and then I was chief accountant there. I was doing cost accounting. Where was that? Uh, San Bernardino. And what was the what company was that? It's a steel fabricator called Valley Engineering Company. Okay. We fabricate the steel and set up the buildings. And how long were you there with them? Oh, three or four years. And then I, st I quit them and started my own business. Studied taxes. Took the IRS exam and was enrolled to practice before the Internal Revenue Service, called an enrolled agent. Then I, with my business, uh, I did taxes. And uh, attorneys cannot practice tax law unless they're tax attorneys. So I had a whole bunch of attorneys, my clients. So I got really high up in taxes. I loved it. And where were you living uh, in those days? Redlands. Okay. Um, is that where you still live? No, Calamasa. Okay. Well, tell me what uh, the street is. That where the kids? How old were your kids at this time when you started your your business? Well, they're all married. They're they, gone. They were gone by that time. Yeah. Okay. And were you? It was your. Did your first wife pass away? Yeah. And uh, what year did she pass away? One eight seven eight. Uh, and were you still in practice at that time? Yes. And so where did you guys live uh, in uh, in Redlands, or what uh, street did you live on? Nottingham Drive, okay. south end of town, uh, within a mile of the Redlands Hospital. Did you have any uh, hobbies? Did you play golf, tennis, no. or any, any stuff like that? No. Any interests? Yeah. Too busy working. When you have your own business, you're busy. You don't get days off and stuff. Yeah. And your second wife, where did you meet her and when? She was a client of mine. And uh, when I lost the first wife, then I got thinking, you know, being single is not worth it. So I picked her and started chasing her and we got married. Yeah. And what, what's her well, name? Well, actually, she caught me. Once she caught you. <laughs> what is that, that song? <laughs> Boy it's a better story than one. A boy chases a girl until she catches him. Yeah, then it's too late. <laughs>
And uh, what was her name at that time? What was her name? Oh, Joyce. Joyce. And uh, and she was a real realtor. Realtor. She had her own business. Oh. So we each had an office in the house. Did she have children? Yes. She had five. Five. And do you know their, uh, what were their names? Well, yeah, you got two boys, Bob and and Scott. The girls are Pat and Natalie and uh, Pat, Natalie and. Escapes me. <laughs> okay. Do they live in California, most of them? No. As Natalie lives in South Dakota. Everybody else in California. No, in Hawaii, too. And what did the, what did the boys do? Uh, what kind of work did they do? Or did well, they do? Scott, his youngest boy, he uh, was Navy. He was in the business of repairing computers and radar. And he became an E-9. He was command E-9 twice, and he's retired from the Navy. He now works for a defense contractor, and he's teaching the Navy how to do those things. And Bob is in Hawaii. He's a real estate uh, appraiser. He's got his own business. He's got two offices over there. And the girls, uh, the oldest one lived in San Jose, and she worked for a bank, and she was the what they call her, but she approved loans. Mm -hmm. And finally she became the manager. She's retired. Another one just lives on a ranch out there in South Dakota. The other daughter, she, she's in real estate. The market's terrible today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, do you still work? No, I retired. When did you retire? Let's see. About 30 years ago. Sold the business and that was it. <laughs> Do you when I computed my income, I was working for $100 a month, so I decided <laughs> it's time to sell. Did you and Joyce have special hobby that you did with maps or anything like that? Yeah. We uh, bought a water home, got involved with an organization called the Mobile Missionary Assistance Program. It's a missionary type thing. And we build churches and related things. We did it for 10 years, and that's all over the United States, Canada. I never went into Canada and go clean up Alaska. Mm. And on this job, to be a mapper, you have to own your own rig, because that's what you live in. All the expenses is on you. When we get to the job site, they provide us a place to park with hookups. And we just did the work. And we took turns being what we call the coordinator or the boss man. Not many of them would take the job. I did. And that's just my nature. And they were like church missions or churches that you would... Well, we construct building construction. We built churches. Built churches. All for one denomination oh, or for any any, anybody? Okay. So long as it wasn't a cult. Yeah. Huh. So we checked them out very close. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. You associated with anything locally in volunteering? Oh, yeah. Right now, I work... I volunteer Lutheran Braille workers. Lutheran Braille workers, I've been there about 10 years now, and uh, we print large print Bibles. We print Braille Bibles in various languages, and we ship all over the world. And I'm in charge of shipping. And do you have a, a church that you go to? Uh, yeah, the uh, Ucapa Christian Church in Ucapa. Pretty much and pretty involved in that, I would think. Yeah, I belong to three separate groups, small groups. Uh, I used to be involved a lot with the serving communion and things like that, but I've pretty well dropped that. And my health's not that good anymore. <laughs> that looks pretty good to me. Um, and so you live in. Calamesa, did you say? Yes. Uh, what street do you live on, or where do you live there? Well, it's the uh, Rancho Calamesa, a mo mobile park. Mm -hmm. So you rent the place and you own your own mobiles. Uh -huh. And you still have your, uh, do you still have your mobile home that you drive around? 
No, you don't drive mobile homes in motor <laughs> no, homes. No, no, I meant your motor home. <laughs> yes, uh, no, I sold it. You did. I got to the point I couldn't couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. I couldn't hook up, it was killing me, so I got rid of it. Uh, okay, I'm gonna change tapes right now. I can get you another drink if you want to. Yeah. How you doing? Okay, yeah. Would you like to, to, this might be a good time for you to read yeah, your... Yeah, take about a half hour. Okay. Whatever. <coughs> this uh, gives you a little more, better information sure. about my combat and so forth. Yeah. All through my teen years, I was interested in aircraft. I made models of World War I aircraft, so my interest in aircraft started at a very young age. During my teen years, I lived in Redlands on Ohio Street, just north of Colton Avenue. I heard a plane going overhead and it sounded very low. So I looked up and there it was, just over the treetops, heading south. So I got on my bicycle to follow the plane and landed on an open field just south of where I-10 is now located. When it came to the end of the field, they crossed a road, flipped over, pushing the prop into the ground. Later, talking to the pilot, I found out he was attempting to land the plane near his auto repair business. He plans to do some maintenance work on his plane. Well, the maintenance... Um, turned out to be a real big job. Now this was the first time I got close to an aircraft. <clears throat> After talking to the pilot, I became even more interested in becoming a pilot. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed our military installations on Hawaii. This is the date the United States entered World War II. At this time, I was a senior in the Redlands High School. On December 2, 1942, I entered Marchfield and enlisted in the Army Air Corps. As I entered the main gates, several recruits were yelling at me, telling me that I would be sorry. Well, they were wrong, and I served for just over 20 years, retired from the Air Force on May 31, 1963. This is one of the most rewarding times of my life. After enlisting as a private, in the Army Air Corps, I started the process of applying for the Aviation Cadet Program. Later in 1943, I was accepted into the Aviation Cadet Program for pilot training, which was started in June of 1943. First aircraft that I flew was a biplane, the Army PT-17, a primary training aircraft which I sold in about seven hours. While learning how to fly the Army PT-17 trainer, an Army P-51 Mustang fighter plane buzzed the field cross T. The T is a large T-shaped item on the airfield that was used to determine the wind direction for the purpose of landing the aircraft. Thus the P-51 buzzed the field 90 degrees to the direction of landing the aircraft in an illegal maneuver. So the tower operator called the fighter plane on the radio asking the pilot for his name and rank. The P-51 pilot did not answer or return a call. So the tower operator called the P-51 fighter again stating, this is Major Wilson, give me your name and rank now. 
Then the P-51 pilot answered the tower, Roger, Dodger, you old codger. I'm a major too. And the P-51 flew off into the sunset. Now, if you believe this, I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> On March 12, 1944, I graduated from the Twin Engine Flying School. At this school, we were flying the Twin Engine Beechcraft known as the AT-10 Bamboo Bomber, as we cadets like to call this aircraft. I remember my flight instructor telling us never to fly this plane upside down. Of course, this was a challenge to all of us cadets. So the next time I was on a solo flight with my co-pilot and I performed some barrel rows just because we were told the wings would come off the aircraft <laughs> when flown upside down. So we made sure that we had positive wing loading throughout the maneuver. I think all of the student pilots did this. <coughs> on the graduation exercise, I was given the Army Air Corps pilot wings. This was a big, big deal. I was also now a flight officer, a World War II rank. The rank is the same as a warrant officer. <coughs> My first assignment was at Tyndall Army Air Corps Base located in Florida. When I arrived, I was surprised to see the flight ramp full of B-17 four-engine bombers, the Flying Fortress. I was assigned at Tyndall Army Air Corps Base for just over one month, getting 49 hours in the B-17 aircraft. On one occasion we were flying some student gunners. The weather got real bad and we found ourselves flying on instruments. It suddenly occurred to me that the pilot was in a dead man spiral. This means that we were flying in a descending circle. The end result is normally a crash. So I suggested that maybe the pilot would let me fly the airplane. Well he did. So I flew it due north, found a light line, and continued until we found a beacon with a green light telling us that it was a military airfield. So the pilot took over and landed. Guess where we were? Tuskegee Flying School of the famous fighter pilots of World War II. <laughs> My next assignment was at Westover Army Air Corps Base located at Springfield, Massachusetts. I went to the flight line and found a field full of B-24 four-engine bombers called the Liberator. I was very disappointed that it was not the B-17. After flying both the B-17 and the B-24, I found that the B-17 was lighter on the controls and thus easier to fly. On the B-17, when the pilot moved the flight controls, he was moving a trim tab on the controls, such as the aileron, rudder, or elevator which moved the control. On the B-24, when the pilot moved the flight controls, he was moving the aileron, rudder, elevator with a cable tied to the flight control <coughs> in the plane's cockpit. Thus, it took much strength to control the aircraft. So it appears that those who designed the aircraft in those days still had a lot to learn about aircraft design. Today's airplanes are easy to control with a touch of your fingertips. The B-24 is a better combat aircraft because it flew further, faster, higher, and carried twice the bomb load of the B-17. The B-24 has two bomb bays. The B-17 has only one bomb bay. The during the period of World War II, there were more made B-24s than the B-17. At Westover Army Air Base, we were assigned to combat crews, and I was assigned as a co-pilot. <clears throat> we got our combat training during this assignment. The school lasted just over one month. After the training, we crews were given a brand new B-24 and were told to fly to Marrakesh to Africa and wait for our combat assignment. In our flight over the Atlantic Ocean, we were flying over a deck of clouds. Our destination was the islands named the Azores. At this time, we pilots were not very experienced in making instrument landings. <coughs> there were many B-24s arriving to land at the Azor Air Base. Suddenly, one of the bomber pilots reported a hole in the cloud just west of the airport. Man, you should have seen all those bombers heading for that hole. As we arrived, each one of the bombers made a dive through the hole and then made a visual approach to the runway. 
This was a great relief for a bunch of green pilots. I guess you thought all pilots in World War II were experienced pilots. Well, we were not. I turned 21 just a month before this flight. I think the pilots were 22 or 23 years of age. The whole crew was just young men with some of the gunners in their teens. We arrived at Marrakesh on August 15, 1944. On August 19, we got our orders and our assignment to a base located in Italy, just inside the spur of the Adriatic Sea, located on the east side of Italy. <coughs> we were assigned to the 742nd Bomb Squadron, 455th Bomb Group of the 15th Air Force. We were a replacement crew to replace a B-24 that was lost in combat the day before. On all of our bombing missions, only the lead aircraft and the deputy lead had the Norton bomb site. During the bomb run, the bombardier would just watch the lead aircraft plane. When the lead plane opened the bomb bay doors, the other bombardiers would do the same. Then when the bomb started leaving the lead plane, all the bombardiers would drop their bomb loads. Now a full formation consisted of six planes called a box. The lead plane was number one. The deputy lead was above the lead plane and on his right wing and was number two. Number three was above and on the left wing of the lead plane. Number four was just behind and below the lead plane called the slot. This sequence continued for six planes. Generally, no plane while in formation were at the same altitude. This way, if you overflew the lead plane, you would simply pass by without crashing into one of the planes in formation. <coughs> the group consisted of four squadrons. This means a group consisted of four boxes, not to exceed six planes per box. After practicing formation flying for several days, we got our first bombing mission on August 24. The target was a coal and oil refinery located in Czechoslovakia. A flight of 8 hours and 15 minutes round trip. We had a load of 500 pound RDX bombs. We were a very green crew and not knowing what to expect on a real bombing mission. This turned out to be a milk run. No fighters, no flag. After this mission, we thought the flying bomb mission was duck soup. But wait, the next mission was a different story. This occurred a few days later with a mission to bomb a railroad bridge in northern Italy. <coughs> After flying just over three hours, we arrived at the IP, a place that the, we fly in a straight line to the target. Guess what? After the initial point, our flight path to the target was full of smoke, where the German 88s were exploding. On the ground, the Germans were shooting the ACAC guns loaded with 88s. The Germans used radar to determine our altitude and then set the shells to explode at our altitude. Anyway, we flew through the flak and dropped our bombs. As far as our crew was concerned, we got through all this without damage. After landing, we discovered that we were wrong. We counted over 125 holes in the aircraft. We found out that all that black smoke was full of lead called shrapnel. After that, we were somewhat nervous when we had to fly through all that flak. We found out that many of the aircraft that were shot down was because of flak, not because of enemy fighter aircraft. My aircraft was shot up on various missions 17 times. It was times like this I thought this was going to be my last mission. We have heard that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, I believe there are no atheists flying heavy bombers during World War II. I've been a Christian as far back as I can remember. So I was always thankful that our Lord was watching over me during this time that I was flying combat in the 15th Air Force. During the, my time as a crew member, I always felt that this was going to be my last mission. Too many crews were being shot down and my time was up. We had to fly 50 missions before rotating back to the United States. On a real bad mission, we got credit for two missions. Thus, I flew 35 and was rotated to the States. 
I never had fear that I would be shot down or killed because that was life during my combat days. I did, however, have some crew members that were so scared that we had to remove them from flight, flight duty. <coughs> On one of my missions to Munich, one burst of flak occurred just under the, my aircraft, knocking out number two and number four engine. The pilot and I were very busy going through the emergency procedure to shut down and feather the props of the two failed engines. The pilot was so disturbed that he ordered bailout. He thought the plane would no longer stay in the air. Being a co-pilot, I was to be the first to leave the aircraft. So I took off the seat belt, shoulder harness, and headed for the bomb bay. The bombs were already dropped, so I was trying to decide whether to dive through the bomb bay or just jump. As I was passing under the top turret, the operator grabbed me by the back of the neck, yelled that the pilot had changed his mind, and for me to return to the co-pilot seat. Boy, was I glad he did. Not miss me or I would have hit the silk, you know. That first step out of the plane was a big one, about 20,000 feet. <coughs> we now had to fly over the Alps to return home to our base in Italy. It was all downhill because we were not able to maintain altitude. The whole formation of bombers just left us all by ourselves. So we had to fly home without protection of the other bombers. So I got on the radio and called for fighter support. Well, one of the fighter pilots returned my call. I don't know where he was. Anyway, I told him my problems and asked for fighter protection on my way, return trip home. The answer was, yes, some man. I'm pretty busy right now. Good luck. After that I answer, I knew that I was in contact with the Red Tail P-51s, the Tuskegee Airmen. On one of our missions, we were loaded with flagitation bombs. These bombs are about two feet long, <coughs> about two inches thick. They were, in fact, large hand grenades. They came in bundles of about 10 or 12 bombs. We were to bomb some German airfield in Greece. When we got to near to the target, we formed a large V formation of 24 aircraft. When the lead ship opened the bomb bay doors, our bombardiers opened their bomb bay doors. Then as the lead ship started dropping his bombs, my bombardier started dropping his bombs, one bundle at a time. This way we were able to saturate the German airfield with fragmentation bombs. We dropped 69 tons of frag bombs on this field. <coughs> We managed to destroy all of the German fighters that were parked. Our fighter escorts of P-51 aircraft dove through our bombs and shot down all the German fighter planes as they were taken off. Many were shot down before they were able to raise their landing gears after takeoff. None of the German fighters were able to reach our formation. After we dropped the bombs, a burst of flak hit our number four engine. The pilot now went through the emergency procedure to shut down the engine and feather the prop. The prop would not feather. To feather the prop, the oil pump used oil from the engine to feather the prop. When we activated the feathering button, all we did was pump out all the oil from the engine. It seemed that the flak had severed the fast feathering line to the prop. After a little while, the engine froze. It felt like the wing was coming off the aircraft. It was then that the plane started flying in a right-hand circle. I had to put both feet on the left rudder pedal to keep the plane going in a straight line. <coughs> so the formation left us. I had to hold the rudder in all the way home, on the whole flight home. One of our missions, the ball turret would not retract back into the airplane. So the ball turret gunner had to stay in the ball turret on the return trip home and stay in the turret during the landing. This was not good because during landing the ball turret would scrape on the runway during a normal landing. So we had to keep the nose down during landing. This was not easy but we managed to do this and the ball turret gunner made it okay. Every squadron had one photographer who would take pictures of the bomb run so that we may determine if we had a good bombing run. The photographer was not assigned to any crew. So at each mission he would be told which plane to fly 
in. Our photographer was afraid to fly it, so when he got into the plane, he would sit on the camera hatch and not move. Camera hatch was located on the floor just back of the waste windows. Just before arriving at the IP, he would open the camera hatch and mount the camera. As soon as the bombs were dropped, he would take the required pictures. Then he would remove the camera and sit on the camera hatch. After he got settled down, he became curious because the gunners were all shooting their 50 caliber guns at the enemy aircraft. So this was the time he got up and moved to the waste window to see the action. Just then a German 88 shell came through the camera hatch, exit through the ceiling of the aircraft. You know what? That photographer never sat on a camera hatch again. <laughs> One thing our fighter pilots found out early in their fighter support of heavy bombers was not to point the nose of their plane at a bomber. If they did, they would get a nose full of lead, namely 50 caliber gun bullets. The reason we shot at them was because we were unable to tell the difference between our plane, the P-51, and the German F-109. <coughs> Both planes looked the same when they were coming straight at us during the heat of the battle. The P-38 was different because that plane had its own look and we knew what it was. So we had to find a way for our gunners to determine our P-51 aircraft from the German fighter aircraft. Well, we found that by painting the Leading edge of the wing of the P-51 yellow, our gunners would be able to determine our planes from the German planes. Man, this worked great. Now our fighters could follow the German planes right through our formation without being shot at. We thought this was the best answer to the problem. We found out that those German pilots are pretty smart. The next day, all the German fighter planes had the leading edge of the wings painted yellow. Well, anyway, it worked for one day. Another mission after leaving the IP initial point, we were flying in tight formation getting ready to drop our bombs when the Germans started firing their flat guns. The sky suddenly filled up with smoke. All of a sudden a burst of flak flew out the windshield right in front of my nose. Man, it got cold and drafty. The temperature was about 30 degrees centigrade below zero. At that time I was wearing my underwear a summer f uniform, a summer flying suit, electrical heated flying suit consisting of suit, gloves, and shoes, and on top of all that I was wearing a very heavy winter flying suit and a steel flak su suit, steel helmets, goggles, and I thought I was going to freeze to death. After landing, it was still below freezing and I felt warm. On one of our missions, I was flying in a slot, namely number four position. Just behind the lead plane, I looked out the right side of my window and checked the plane flying on my right wing. Just then, we flew through a cloud. When we cleared the cloud, the, pilot, the plane was no longer on my right wing. He must have received a direct hit with an 88 because we never saw him again. This has bothered me ever since, not knowing what happened to that plane. <clears throat> On one of our missions, the group leader, a full bird colonel, got shot down. He was flying the lead plane with the group navigator and bombardier. Thus, the deputy lead, flying the number two position, was now our leader. Upon landing with his parachute, the group leader managed to avoid contact with the German troops. He was near a German field, so he stayed close to the fence to see what was going on. After a few days, he entered the airfield, stole a German fighter plane, and took off. Later, he flew over our field, and after a few circles, he landed and was surrounded by our military police. After he climbed out of the German fighter plane, the military police and the other personnel recognized who he was. I wonder, did Hitler ever find out about the stolen aircraft? The Germans made flyable some of the Allied aircraft that landed on the German fields or crash landed in their territory. There wasn't much they could do with these airplanes as they would be shot down by their own gunners. However, there is at least one account when the Germans flew a restored B-24 
and joined our formation. While we were on a mission, before reaching the target, the Phantom B-24 joined our formation. We had flight, re had flight escort from the fine squadron of black pilots that was reported them, and one responded, I'll go scare him out, but you tell your boys not to f point their guns at me. He came in and the Phantom said he was going from the 55th wing and, and got lost. There was no such thing as a 55th wing from Italy with heavy bombers. We did not know his intentions. It would have been easy for them, been an easy matter for him to return those guns, 50 caliber guns on the B-24s on us and cause much damage. The pilot, pilot gave bursts from his guns and warned the pilot to turn back or he will be escorted. And he will be escorted. And the response was that he could make it on alone. The black pilot said, you are going to be escorted whether you want it or not. You are going to have two men on your tail all the way back. And don't try to land in Yugoslavia. The phantom pilot and said, I wanted to drop his bombs. His response? When the fighter pilot was, you ain't going to drop no bombs. This was the last we saw of the Phantom B-24. When World War II ended, the four major powers met in Potsdam to map out the four control zones. Each had its own zone of responsibility. Further Berlin was within the Soviet area of responsibility and was divided into four zones, controlled by the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. On June 24, 1948, the Russians blockaded the city of Berlin. The, all the Allied response to that blockade, the Berlin Airlift. The Berlin blockaded June 24, 1948 to May 11, 1949. Because one of the first major crises of the new Cold War, when the Soviets blockaded Railroads and highway access to Berlin. The Berlin blockade lasted 320 days as Great Britain, the United States supplied up to 13,000 tons of food, fuel, and other items daily in an, air, in an airlift code named Operation Vettels to West Berlin. The theater commander, General Clay, had decided that if he was not permitted to force his way through to Berlin, he would suspend the rail service and fly the supplies. The 61st Troop Carriers Group, equipped with C-47 stationed at Rhine Main Air Base, was ordered to begin immediate flying of supplies for the American garrison in, in Berlin. Before the first supply-laden C-47 took off with their three-ton load, Major Albert Snyder, 53rd Squadron, took a special mission. The 53rd C-47 flew, flew empty from their base to Berlin, where they circled in the city several times. Then they returned to Rhein-Main. The mission was to test the Soviet's reaction. This flight earned their nickname of Clay's Pigeons. <coughs> At the same time, General Clay ordered a military freight train bound for Berlin not to stop for inspection at the checkpoint. When the Soviets allowed the plane to pass unmolested, Clay ordered resumption of rail service. In the three days that train had stopped, the 25 operational C-47s of the 61st had flown 125 tons of supply to the city. Tension mounted again when on April 7, regular scheduled Vicar Vikings of the British European Airways, carrying 10 passengers and crew, was on approach to Gatow Airport, located in Berlin. When it was buzzed by a Yak-3 from a nearby fighter field. After the initial pass, the Yak turned for another pass and collided with the civilian plane, killing all aboard. <coughs> Clay met the German leader, Ernest Ruder, and his aide, William Brannett, advised them of his airlift plans, and the consequence the people faced it failed. Within 24 hours, singularly or otherwise, as they were operational with the mission, until, a, 
Until the C-54s arrived, however, the aircraft depended on the good old C-47 as three-ton load per aircraft to spy Berlin. Most of the available C-47s and aircraft were battle-borne worn and still had the invasion stripes of Normandy other than the dusty rose color from the African campaign. Pilots wore in short supply. If your file indicated you had a set of wings on your chest and you had a few hours of multi-engine time, you wore it into the air. Deaths or staff assignments meant nothing. In a few instances, some even found that after flying eight hours, they still had their desk job waiting. Even General LeMay had a few flights. Early in August 1948, while stationed at McClellan Air Force Base located in Sacramento, California, we departed for Germany in a C-54 aircraft, crewed by a pilot, co-pilot, and flight engineer, to fly the Berlin airlift. We arrived at Fosberg, Germany, my new military assignment, located in the British zone of Germany. My first mission was two trips to Berlin on August 21st, 1948. This time I was the co-pilot because I was not current in the aircraft. In October I became an instructor pilot. It was my job in addition to flying missions to teach the new pilots how to fly the C-54 aircraft. At that time I was 25 years old. On this base we carried coal. The coal was in 100 pound bags. And in the cargo compartment of the aircraft we had large squares marked on the floor with a number in each square, showing the loading crew how many bags to be loaded in that square. After loading, the air crew, loading crew would put the large net over the load and tie it down. <coughs> this, was a, this way the pilot did not have to run a weight and balance before each takeoff because the weight and balance was already been completed. The loading crews were all German civilians. After I landed in Berlin and as soon as the plane engines were shut down, the Germans backed a truck to the rear door and began unloading the coal. And as soon as we departed the flight deck, the Germans stopped everything because they wanted to buy black market cigarettes. If I remember, a carton of cigarettes sold for $10. Our cost $1. <coughs> the C-47 aircraft called sign was Little Willie, plus two numbers such as Lil Willie 1 2. The call sign for the C 54 was Big Willie. One day I was flying to Berlin in an aircraft making a position report for the benefit of all pilots traffic report his call sign. This was William 3 6. Man, the radio got busy. Who is William? It turned out that William was a C 74, a very large four engine aircraft used for carrying very large items to Berlin. On our flight to and from Berlin, we did not have any ground or radar supports to separate the air aircraft from each other. So at certain points, we would give our position report telling all the other pilots if we were going to gain or lose some time to the next checkpoint. We had one P-47 aircraft with a master airspeed indicator. He would fly in formation with us and tell us how fast we were flying. This way we were able to calibrate our airspeed indicators. <coughs> During March of 1949, I was transferred to Frankfurt, Germany, Rhine Main Airfield. At this space, we carried only food items to Berlin. My total trips to Berlin was 260. In one of the quarters leading to Berlin, the Russians had an air-to-ground gunnery range in the middle of the air quarter. On many occasions I would see the Russian Yak-3 fighter planes making runs on the ground target. So one day as I saw the fighters dive down the target, I felt like having some fun. So I took the C-54 and made a dive to the target with the fighter planes. Well, the Yak pilots saw what was happening and scattered all over the sky. It wasn't long before one was one of the Yaks was flying formation with me, flying on my right wing. I waved at him and he waved back. Then we departed and continued our mission. It seemed that all pilots were the same and liked to have fun with each other. After all, 
I was only 25 years old at the time. Man, what if this, what if the newspaper medium found out about this? It would have been all, been in all the newspapers throughout the country. Needless to say, my crew did not say anything to anyone. On one of my flights to Berlin, we had offloaded our cargo of coal on a night takeoff for our return trip to Fosberg. We lost one engine. In my student pilot and the pilot seat, he was somewhat concerned because he was not yet up to date with the aircraft. So I told him, just fly the plane, I would feather the engine and clean up the cockpit. This I did. On, our, on a return trip, we experienced bad weather. We were flying on instruments. We started getting St. Elmo's fire. This is when the aircraft loads up with static electricity. This is when the tips of the propeller lights up as though they were neon lights. Also, the cockpit windshield was electric streaks all over it, the surface of the glass. Then after a short period of time, the aircraft was, had too much electric, and in, in a moment, the electric discharge from the aircraft like a bolt of lightning. At that moment, we were all blinded, and I yelled at the flight engineer to put the spotlight on the instrument panel so that we can maintain control of the aircraft. <coughs> At this time, the student pilot was somewhat nervous, so we changed seats so that I was now flying the aircraft. The static electricity continued to explode off the aircraft, so I made the decision to land at a close airport called Teagle. We were on the final approach, and during the final approach, during the flare-out, the static electricity discharged again, so I ordered full power and froze the controls until I could see again. Then I boarded the landing. At that point, we just flew home, made a three-engine safe landing. After landing, my flight engineer went to the operations officer and turned in his wings. As far as I know, he had not returned to flying. This is the only time I had ever experienced this type of action with St. Elmo's fire. I had talked to many pilots, and not one of them had ever had this, happen, had this experience. <clears throat> As an instructor pilot, it was my duty upon landing in Berlin to check all the squadron aircraft to see if any of them had engines out. If I found one, I would tell the pilot to take my plane and I would fly his back to our home base. There was no aircraft maintenance in Berlin, so on a few occasions I would make three engine takeoff and fly to our home base. During my Air Force career, I managed to check out a 19 different aircraft. The plane that was my favorite was a P-51 Mustang. To take off, you must use full power and hold it for 30 seconds. Just don't do this during the takeoff run while on the runway. You must put the power on gently. And finally, full power after you are airborne. If you give it full power on the runway, the torque would turn the aircraft upside down on the runway. <clears throat> Many pilots did just that on their first takeoff, and none had survived on their very first takeoff in this plane. It is a solo flight because the plane has only one seat. After 20 years of service, I retired on May 31, 1963, with the rank of major. My son, also a pilot, retired from the Air Force with the rank of major. Any questions? Fantastic, Gary. Tell me about when you flew the airplane upside down. Do you, oh, the AT-10? Yeah. What do you want to know? How did you feel? Well, it was just normal maneuver as far as I was concerned because they had flown single engine and you did barrel rolls, slow rolls. Now, a slow roll, you roll on a point. In a barrel roll, it's a big circle thing like that, but you are got a positive G on the aircraft all the time, so you never get a negative G-force on the wings. Therefore, you won't pull the wings off. Okay. Now, in a AT-10, if you did have negative G, I'm sure the wing would come off. Were you away from the base when you did this? Weren't you afraid that someone at the base might see you? Well, when you fly in a local area, it's a large area, so you're not right inside of the base. 
Was it a thrill? Oh yeah, I loved every minute of it. I mean, you know, pilots are a different kind of people. We like excitement. Uh, give an example of excitement. One day at McClellan Air Force Base, Sacramento. I was at base ops and I was going to fly a T-6 as a trainer with retractable gear and a 450 horsepower engine. While I was filling out the clearance, a sergeant came up to me and says, I bet you take me up in that plane, you can't make me sink. Now that's a direct challenge. I said, well, okay, let's find out. So I put him on the clearance, went out to the airplane, went through the normal procedure, checking it out, and took off. So I went to 10,000 feet. And then I did what we call a Whipperdale. A Whipperdale is nothing more than one maneuver after another. Whatever comes in mind, you did it. Oh a loop, a roll, snap roll, whatever. Whatever oh. comes in mind, you did it. And as you do those maneuvers, you keep losing altitude, see. So when I got to a lower altitude where I thought it was time to level off, I went back to 10,000 feet and did it again. Every time I looked back at him, he was just grinning. So I did another Whipperdale. And I checked him, and he was still grinning. So when it got too low, I went back to 10,000 feet and started my third one. About halfway down, guess who was getting sick? <laughs> Me. <laughs> yeah, I started to feel real uneasy. So I notified the guy in the back seat. I said, hey, you know, it's time to quit. So I never told him I was getting sick. Landed the airplane and let it go at that. Of all things, I couldn't make him sick. He was right. Yeah, and he grinned the whole, whole thing. That's how he got his flights, challenging the pilots. <laughs> I think I heard you say that you were prepared to parachute out of an aircraft one time. Was that the only occasion? Yeah, that you... the B-24 in combat. And had you received training in Yeah, we were told not to do it. It was trained, but we never actually jumped. If you didn't do it right the first time, you were in trouble. <laughs> I've heard that uh, the the different uh, airplanes that are lined up to take off on a mission that you do not make friends with the other pilots or the other crew members because they might not all return. Is that true, or no. is that that's not true? That's just a story. Okay. Okay. Besides, a lot of the crews, you never met them anyway. They probably shot down the first or second mission, so you never got to meet them. Do you <clears> keep <throat> in contact with any of the men no that more. you served with? No. I've lost them. We had a, a letter was going around, and someone failed to keep it going, and so we lost everything. Were there any special treats that were given to children while you guys were flying into... Uh, Berlin. Well, what we did, and some of the squatters did, they'd make these parachutes out of uh, hankies, then put candy with it, and then drop it on the final approach. And of course, the kids all knew this, so they, a bunch of them down there, all scrambling all for it. waiting for it. But uh, my squatter never did it. Now, I think it was a squadron from uh, Ryan Maine that did that, Frankfurt. Were you given box lunches when you went on a mission? No. What? Well, it's not that far to Berlin couple hours you were there and there's a snack bar at both ends so you had time to grab coffee or tea or crumpets as the British called it. The B-17 the payload is 6,000 pounds of bombs. You said the B-24 was twice? It carried that twice the bomb load. Had two bomb bays. Oh. B-17 only has one. Right. Oh, biggest load I've had was six 1,000 pounders. That airplane carried a heck of a load, <laughs> much more than a B-17, but it's a Davis wing. It's a much, much more effective than the big wing the B-17 had. You can go higher, I think, with those uh, thin wings. Well, with that yeah. wing, uh, it was more effective. It went higher, it went faster, and went further, and carried twice the load. I think maybe we're about ready to wrap it up. You guys have Sounds anything good. else you want to, or anything else you'd like to add, Harry? No, I think I pretty well covered yeah, it with yeah, the talk. That's great. I'm glad you did that. Harry, thank yeah. you for your service to our country. Thanks for coming and sharing with us today. Bob, thanks for coming along. Yes, sir. Really Pleasure enjoyed that. Joe. That was great. The airplanes, photos, or something? Yeah, yeah, Bob, they, they look really good. Yeah. Good. Okay.
Yeah. They come out of right there. They did, yeah. Uh -huh. I had to go to the computer and find them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, once I got them, I don't let them go. I think, yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, just sit back down there and get, let me get a picture. Oh.